Hello, it's Julie. Hi, Julie. This is Sarah Bell. I can hear you. Uh, hi, that's great. Yeah. Can yes. you hear me okay? Yes, very clear. All right, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Anthony Twyman. I am one of the IPC consultants with the WHO HQ IPC unit, and I'm more than happy today to be involved in today's um, seminar on hand hygiene. I just wanna say welcome to everyone that's online currently and welcome to those that are just joining. If I can ask everyone just quickly to make sure they're on mute before we kick off, and we'll do a quick um, few housekeeping things before we start our session today. Um, today's webinar is actually a third in, in a series installment with many more that to come. Um, so today's will be a focus on hand hygiene. The 21st of April uh, is a focus on environmental cleaning and the 23rd focus on sanitation. So hopefully everyone's marked their calendars for the other events to come. And we just want to say again, uh, thank you to all those joining for today. Quickly just looking in the chat here, we can see that we're covering quite the globe. So I think it's nice to to have such a global presence on what we all know to be a very important topic, um, not just hand hygiene, but this whole series together, but knowing fundamentally and given the time that we're in, that this is, this is a pretty critical thing. Um, I just wanna remind everyone, we do have the chat box, so please use it as a means to introduce and chat amongst one another, but you can also use it as a means to post your questions. Um, I imagine questions will come up as we go through this today, and if you could just put them there in real time. Uh, we have many colleagues on the line, some from WHO WASH, UNICEF, um, some IPC regional colleagues. We'll all be available and on hand to help answer them in real time. For the questions that maybe don't get answered or we're not sure, we will mark those and um, make sure to follow up with them in our, our, our FAQs to come and, and post some information later with regards to that. Now, just before we kick off and I hand over to two very close colleagues, I just want to say, I mean, it is a privilege and um, it's a nice collaboration to be working with our WASH colleagues coming from the IPC world where we know the fundamentals of WASH serve to support and promote um, IPC best practices. So I think today's topic, hand hygiene, we all know as a, a gold standard intervention for both day-to-day -day practices, but also especially in the time that we're in right now amongst COVID. So, I'm very happy to be here today. Hopefully can contribute and, and hear from all of you that um, when we get later into the Q&A period. Now I'm gonna hand over to two very close colleagues of mine that we've worked together for some years who also maybe many of you know already given the, the topic of today and their expertise around this. Claire Kilpatrick and Julie Storr, um, both having crossed the borders between IPC and WASH. So without further ado, I'll hand over to them. Thank you, Anthony. It's Julie Storr here to kick off and thank you all for joining. So I 
a part of WHO's WASH in Healthcare Facilities team. And if we could move on to the next slide. So I want to start with an important point. Today's session is informed by all of the normative guidance and resources that are available on WASH in healthcare facilities and infection prevention and control IPC to support safe practice always. What some are referring to as during peacetime, non-pandemic times. But of course, we're in April 2020. So this session undoubtedly is also informed by COVID-19 specific guidance. And this guidance has and continues to be issued and updated. And I will draw on that as we move through the session. Next slide. So here I highlight the wash and waste management for the prevention of COVID-19 technical note that I know many of you will have seen. What does this technical note tell us about safe care and where does hand hygiene fit? Well, as you can see here, the technical note highlights a number of things that we've touched on or will touch on during this webinar series. Today is about hand hygiene. Frequent and effective hand hygiene is highlighted in this note as one of the most important prevention measures and it emphasizes the right time and the right technique. Next slide. Now I shift to WHO's infection prevention and control guidance relevant to COVID. This IPC COVID-19 interim guidance is crystal clear. Apply standard precautions for all patients. Standard precautions, of course, includes many different things, and that's not what we're going to go into today, but hand hygiene is one part of standard precautions. Next slide. So let's zoom in on hand hygiene. And again, this IPC COVID-19 interim guidance is clear. Healthcare workers should apply the five moments approach, and more on that in a moment. It also addresses what to use to clean hands. Again, we'll expand on this. And what you can see here is that the guidance for COVID is no different to how we approach hand hygiene during non-outbreak times. The focus is on the right time, the right technique, the right moments, the right products. The challenge as ever, and we will drill into this today, is implementation and behavior change. And that's really what a lot of the focus of today is. Next slide. We're going to start with some fundamental facts about hand hygiene that I know some of you will be very familiar with, but these are important reminders that help us all build a very strong and compelling narrative on the importance of hand hygiene. In the current pandemic, the profile of hand hygiene has been raised probably like never before, but there is still misinformation and mythology out there, and that can be dangerous. So here are some simple nuggets. During care delivery, hands are contaminated by potentially harmful microbes from different sources. And some of these, some of these may be capable of causing outbreaks. Some may be resistant to antibiotics. Hand hygiene stops the spread of these microbes. It protects people, it protects patients, it protects staff. Achieving hand hygiene at the right times is still a challenge everywhere. Next slide. In some cases, you might find that data are powerful in helping you build your strong case when you're trying to convince colleagues and managers and policymakers and the public. Data on the extent of the problem can help to drive improvement. And here, there's some global data on the burden of harm. And my colleague, Rick Johnston, is going to focus a little later on WASH relevant data. But what we have is data from high and low income countries that still indicates compliance is a challenge. And it can be as low as 0% with levels frequently around 40% from the WHO figures. And I heard even today from a colleague in Southeast Asia that even in this pandemic, compliance in healthcare at the right time is suboptimal. And importantly, a couple of global surveys that some of you may have taken part in from my, my WHO IPC colleagues 
on hand hygiene self-assessment frameworks highlighted that system change remains a challenge, more on this in a second, that institutional safety climate, creating that safe culture, that critical ingredient for success, was the element of the improvement strategy for hand hygiene that scores the lowest. And Claire's going to go into this more in a moment. Next slide. So for those of you looking to strengthen hand hygiene programmes or reinvigorate them, I like the fact that my WHO IPC colleagues have this nice phrase of the five golden rules for hand hygiene in their training slides. And the link to that is available at the bottom of this slide. As you can see, these five golden rules focus on the right time, the right technique. And that's what we're going to go into for the rest of this session. So if we can move on to the next slide. I'm going to start with an important definition that I think shapes everything else that we do and train about in hand hygiene, this point of care. Golden rule number one from that previous slide was that hand hygiene must be performed at the point of care. The point of care is that place where three elements occur together and being clear on this can really facilitate our understanding and our narrative of when hand hygiene should occur that right time. What we don't want is people to think they're safe by performing hand hygiene when it won't interrupt germ transmission and then not performing it when it will. And the point of care in the five moments tries to overcome this challenge. What it means is that hand hygiene infrastructures, including products, should be in place and easily accessible at the point of care. Next slide. On this next slide, we see that iconic five moments image that's now widely used across the world. And as an infection preventionist, the beauty of the five moments for me is in its many benefits that it can have in how we talk to people and train people and monitor people and, and embed this safety culture. It simplifies getting across messages of the right time for hand hygiene, the when. It's applicable in, in any care setting. It's logical. It's about integrating hand hygiene into workflow. It's easy to remember, it's sticky, it can be put on a poster to reinforce and to sell hand hygiene. It encourages a consistent approach to training and to monitoring and observations of health workers and it's evidence-based. And I know many colleagues who work in health facilities always carry a little poster or a pocket booklet that has this image on that can be used when they're talking to their colleagues about hand hygiene. Next slide. So even as you can see here, hot off the press, the poster for this year's WHO Save Lives Clean Your Hands campaign, which is now very much in the context of COVID-19 features and reinforces the five moments. Next slide. And as I mentioned, it's applicable in any setting. And if you're not already familiar with this document that's referenced on this slide that you can access after the session, this document has many images that are superb for teaching. And if we move to the next slide, this document also has many different scenarios that might be encountered in healthcare vaccination clinics, long-term care, dialysis unit, and it breaks down each encounter into this sequence of stepwise sequence of care, and then highlights where to perform hand hygiene and which moment this corresponds to. And it can really transform teaching and understanding of hand hygiene, targeted hand hygiene that will protect people and save lives. The example given here is a general practitioner consultation. The next slide, if you do, maybe not familiar with the five moments or you want a quick refresher at this time, there's, this is an excellent video journal article that my colleagues from WHO were involved with and it's freely available, it's available in multiple languages and we've given the clip from two minutes 44 to six minutes 16 zooms in on the five moments. It really is, if you haven't seen this, I highly recommend this. And now I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Claire Kilpatrick. Next slide. Thank you, Jules and Anthony. So 
Julie has clearly outlined a number of key things and started to already introduce a number of phrases that are important if we are all to be those people, those advocates, those role models, those trainers, talking to others about how to perform hand hygiene. Now today we don't have the luxury of time to do the full training on the five moments for hand hygiene in the reality. So the rest of the session is not about how and when to clean your hands. It's actually going to focus in on empowering all of you to take an approach that no matter what you're setting, you can adopt all of the materials and resources and understand how to do improvement and, and, and affect that behaviour change which Julie's already mentioned. So just to reiterate, all of the guidance, both COVID-19 guidance and all of those monumental WHO guidelines and documents for improving hand hygiene at all times, reinforce a number of things about the importance of hand hygiene. But very importantly, and what I'm drilling into, is that they highlight that improvement is achievable by using a combination of different strategies. And that's why today we want to focus on that, to help you, to empower you, as I've said, to know what strategies to take, whatever you are faced with. And WHO call this a multimodal approach or a multimodal strategy. Multiple approaches that target the many different influencers of human behaviour and address potential barriers and facilitators. So multimodal just means many methods. And again, there's another WHO document available that describes this approach in detail. The image is here, it's called the Guide for Implementation. But to summarise this, what we'll go through now are five key elements to this multimodal improvement strategy proven to work for hand hygiene and in a range of other infection prevention settings. And those five things, as you'll see at the icons at the bottom of this screen, are one, build it, two, check it, three, oh, sorry, two, um, train, three, check it, four, sell it, and five, live it. So let's look at these in detail. Next slide. Number one, build it. That system change, Julie's already mentioned that phrase earlier when we talked about the results from the global surveys. What does it mean? It means infrastructure and resources. It means systems to procure, deliver and manage the right resources and a budget dedicated for this. And there's some key questions going forward that you can ask about your facility to demonstrate that the infrastructure and that system change has been supported. You can ask, are staff able to clean their hands at the right times at every point of care? Are the resources in easy reach for when busy health workers and others are doing critical tasks with vulnerable people and need to be able to clean their hands? So this very much comes back to that definition of a point of care, which is critical for all hand hygiene activities. But we want to bring this to life. What does this really mean for facilities? What would it look like? Well, it means that there is an annual planned budget, which includes funding for different infrastructure and services that are required for hand hygiene, both the products, but other wash related services. It means hand hygiene stations at points of entry, points of care, close to toilets, and we'll come on and talk more about this. It means functioning hand hygiene stations, and that word functioning is really important, that they are not just set up, but they're not working. We have to remember others that are important, and that means those in service and waste disposal areas, not just those at the front line of care. It also means having policies and standard operating procedures that outline the information. So if you build it to start with, then you will already be on a good journey for improving hand hygiene. Next slide. Coming back to COVID-19, knowing that everyone has many questions on this, the technical note certainly has consistency with the recommendations of this first element of a multimodal improvement strategy. It highlights that functioning hand hygiene facilities should be available and it reiterates key points, which is around points of care, when PPE is put on or taken off, when waste is managed, for others, not just frontline health workers, access near toilets, entry and exit of facilities and waiting and dining rooms. 
So all the way through, as Julie already started with, our recommendations for hand hygiene and for COVID-19 are consistent. And I want to just mention briefly the role of alcohol hand rub, which we know is not available in all settings, but the beauty and ease of being able to use it in the majority of times in order to ensure hands can be cleaned at the point of care should be realised in most settings as far as possible. Not only do companies make these products available, but WHO many years ago, working with the University Hospitals of Geneva, came up with two formula which actually tell you how to create alcohol-based hand drop. We know that's still a challenge in many settings, but a lot of progress has been made in this regard. And we want to emphasize again, how helpful it can be to make hand hygiene easier at the point of care. The options are available and indeed, this formula was listed in WHO's lists of essential medicines a number of years ago, just emphasising again what a critical life-saving approach this can be in healthcare. Next slide. And tied in still with this build it, this system change aspect of hand hygiene, is a new WHO obligatory note for hand hygiene. And many of you may have seen this, but if you haven't, it was launched recently by the Director General at WHO very clearly talking about the obligation of member states to providing facilities and resources for hand hygiene. It's a great opportunity now to be able to push that build it aspect of hand hygiene by having this note issued to all member states. And it highlights hand hygiene facilities for all settings in, in the community settings that I've highlighted here because this session is about healthcare, that once again, and building on the results of those two global surveys, we have to improve access to facilities in healthcare facilities because we know this is still not a reality. Next slide. Moving on to the second element of this multimodal improvement strategy to help you take action in your settings. Teach it. So you can ask yourself in the facilities, who needs to be trained to address gaps in knowledge and practice? Do you know the gaps in knowledge and practice in your setting? Make sure your actions are targeted. So ask these questions. How will it happen? How will the training happen? Who will undertake it? Do you have the expertise available? Are training resources up to date and reinforce and embed the five moments for hand hygiene? In our many years, Julie and I have seen many different healthcare settings that we've supported whereby they have a policy on hand hygiene that says one thing, they train on another thing, they audit on another way that hand hygiene should be performed, and all of the reminders around how to do hand hygiene give various messages. If we do not join up all of the content of our policies, our training and other messages with recommendations for safe, timely hand hygiene, this is the five moments for hand hygiene, then we will not be able to support our workers to do the right thing at the right time. So what does Teach It look like in a facility? It means an available current targeted training package that suits your setting. It means using a range of tools and approaches to engage the audience, not thinking that one slide set will suit all needs. It means having a schedule available to suit busy health workers. It means that healthcare personnel receive orientation training on hand hygiene and that they're trained every year. Next slide. So just as one part of your training, we've picked out here, again, just to emphasize the consistency with the COVID-19 technical note hand hygiene recommendations just one example here of what you might do as part of your training. And this is about using existing materials. We've talked about many things already that will help you improve hand hygiene and all of the things we've mentioned have supporting tools and resources available from WHO and from other organisations. So don't make work for yourselves. Use existing WHO posters to help you train. And we've pulled out the example of the technique which is recommended in the technical notes, and we've just highlighted what the recommendation is. So the information is there for you from the original recommendations reiterated for COVID-19. And as I mentioned, the training on the five moments application, Julie has introduced, how that can happen for different settings, but indeed training on that is a full session in itself, which maybe we'll get to do with you one day soon. Next slide. 
The third element is about check it, monitoring, but importantly, feedback. So what we want to do to improve hand hygiene, along with having that infrastructure, along with training people, is have the right things in place to monitor and use valid tools that again are available. And ask already to start with at your facility. Do you already uh, monitor hand hygiene compliance in a range of health workers? Do you monitor hand hygiene perceptions and knowledge to inform your training sessions? How is feedback given that will support improvement? How will your facility know that improvement is taking place to positively reinforce that people are doing good work? And do you monitor those resources and supplies? I already said functioning hand hygiene stations are critical. It's not that you can put a system in place and then realise that actually there's no soap, there's no alcohol hand rub, there's no running water. So what does monitoring look like in a facility? Hand hygiene monitored regularly and, fed back and feedback being posted to inform healthcare personnel, not auditing that never then is reported back to help them improve. Audits undertaken within a schedule to assess the availability of the resources that should be in place. It's very difficult to ask people to clean their hands if we don't have the right things in place for them and this should be checked frequently. The use of tools like Wash Fit, and that's what this series is all about, supporting you to be Wash Fit and COVID-19 and IPC ready. And there are other tools, and we won't drill into all of these today, but there are a range, depending on your situation, that you can use. And one of the examples here is the WHO observation form against the five moments. And there's also, as we mentioned in these global surveys, a WHO hand hygiene self-assessment framework. And if you can understand your starting point for hand hygiene and what's happening in your facility, you can plan your journey. And all of these tools will help you. Next slide. The next one, sell it. So we've had four elements of this multimodal improvement strategy. This one can often seem like the most exciting and easiest one to do. And in all my experiences, and when I worked in country, people were always excited about creating posters. But we want to reinforce to you that if you only do this, the evidence tells us that that will not support overall improvement of hand hygiene. So again, questions to ask your facility. How do you publicize actions to support hand hygiene? It might not be that posters are the right way for your setting. Do you engage your healthcare personnel to help produce reminders? This is really important that those messages will work with them and will resonate with them. Do all your posters and reminders reinforce the evidence, the recommendations from all of the work that's been done to see how we can keep people safe? Again, reiterating that five moments for hand hygiene. And what does this look like? A range of hand hygiene promotion and educational materials, clearly visible, understandable, and in key places, and that should probably read the right places for your audience. And they should be replaced if they're damaged or on a regular basis. Much work has been done to tell us that people will become blind to these reminders over time. And certainly back many years ago when Julie led the monumental and, and um, award-winning campaign in England many, many years ago, there was a recommendation there that posters should be changed every two weeks or otherwise people walk past and forget to realise that those posters are actually telling them a message and helping them to do the right thing. We also want people to, if they can, participate in local, national, regional and global hand hygiene campaigns. This will help keep awareness. Next slide. So coming back to what Julie mentioned already, WHO Save Lives, Clean Your Hands 5th May Hand Hygiene Campaign has been running since 2009. This year, the focus is on nurses and midwives to help engage them in clean hands at the right times. So it's not that it's not important for everyone else, but that's the focus for this year's campaign. And as Julie's also mentioned, there's also resources available about the campaign in the context of COVID, but the recommendations are not different. The WHO recommendations for hand hygiene are the same, but in fact, we're just creating new materials to help engage people. So we do encourage you to be aware and join in this campaign. Next slide. And one way you can take part is the call to action for joining the Safe Hands Challenge. 
I'm sure many of you will have seen this, but the DG from WHO launched this some weeks ago now in support of COVID and just overall to raise the awareness of hand hygiene. And essentially, the hashtag Safe Hands Challenge in 2020 is just one part of global high-level advocacy on hand hygiene that will help us all in our efforts because lots of people are supporting the message to tell everyone to clean their hands. And that's never more important than the fact to reiterate the data that two in five healthcare facilities globally lack hand hygiene at the point of care. So if you want to be part of that element of the campaigning, to help spread awareness as one part of your action, then do clean your hands with alcohol hand job or washer and soap and post a video and use the hashtag safe hands. Next slide. So we're almost finishing this part of the session because we're on to the fifth element of this improvement strategy. Julie already mentioned this again at the beginning about how it's the element that's seen least improvement and it's challenging to create a safety culture, a culture that values the importance of hand hygiene. And there's often no one answer for this, but there are a number of examples here. It really does depend on the local setting, but again, we encourage you to address the local culture and you can do this by asking key questions. How do you make and maintain hand hygiene as a facility priority? Is it discussed at the highest level? Are managers, champions and other opinion leaders constantly engaged over time? Do all levels of staff and other leaders role model, take part in, value the importance of the five moments? And what this might look like is training, monitoring, communication plans being supported, as we've started out by talking about how important those things are, as well as infrastructure. That messages from leaders, whoever they may be in your setting, are visible and audible that leaders actually are seen to attend training on hand hygiene. Having worked in many, many different health facilities to help them improve hand hygiene, those that had the good culture and that seen most success were those where the chief executive officer turned up to the sessions that we were delivering in those hospitals. That's a sign of a safety culture. That's not just about being able to role model hand hygiene, that's about commitment. But also we want to know that people have responsibility for washing IPC and that staff are awarded and managed, all important in influencing a culture. Next slide. So in summary, back to what the COVID-19 technical note tells us. It says that healthcare facilities should establish or strengthen their hand hygiene programmes and at a minimum, procure the resources they need and the supplies, refresh on hand hygiene training, and refresh your communications and reminders. But what we've presented here to you today as your strategy, as your starting point for going forward and improving hand hygiene is the multimodal strategy proven, tested in many settings, and published in many documents by individual authors, but also summarized by WHO. So we really encourage you to be able to build it, teach it, check it, sell it, and live it, and this will achieve success. Next slide. Finally, let's have our mantra. Julie started with some key messages that we want you all to reiterate in your narrative, and here we have another final reminder that frequent and timely and effective hand hygiene is one of the most important measures to prevent all infections and COVID-19. It stops transmission from infected individuals and contaminated surfaces. And all of us together, WASH and IPC practitioners, need to be strategic and plan, use the tools available and use this multimodal improvement approach so that hand hygiene can happen at the right time using the right technique with the resources available to us. Next slide. This is in the slide set, which is now already available on the washinghealthcarefacility.org web platform, all of the resources to let you easily find all of the things that we've talked about. Next slide. So I want to thank you and hand over to my colleague Rick for the next couple of slides.
Okay, thanks. I was just on mute there. So, um, hello everyone. This is Rick Johnson from WHO. And I just have a couple of slides. So first I thought it would be good to reflect on um, some of the challenges about hand washing in areas where soap and water or alcohol hand rub are not available. And this is particularly in households, you know, not necessarily the healthcare facility setting. <clears throat> we know that globally, uh, about 40% of people do not have hand washing facilities with soap and water in the household. And there are different reasons for that in different settings. Often there, there is water available, but not soap. Uh, and soap, especially bar soap or commercial um, bar soap marketed for hand washing can be expensive, but there are alternatives that people can use. Uh, one of those is called soapy water. And this has been uh, used in several countries, especially in Bangladesh for routine hand washing. And this is just simply mixing some powdered laundry detergent with water. Uh, usually it's around 20 grams to a liter, um, depending on the formulation. And rinsing, getting your hands wet uh, with that and then lathering up with that and then rinsing with regular rinse water. And this is of course much less costly than bar soap. It's just as effective. It's also less prone to being um, stolen or for having animals. Um, take the soap, which, which can, can be an issue with bar soap. Apart from soapy water, uh, in some cultures, it's uh, traditional to wash hands with things like ash or soil or mud, especially after defecation. It's not so common to do that before eating. But um, uh, this has also been shown to be effective and can be at least a short-term measure. Um, especially ash uh, is, is a nice traditional method material because it's less likely to be contaminated. Uh, and it also can inactivate pathogens by raising the pH. However, any of these ash or soap or ash or soil or mud or sand kind of traditional materials can get trapped underneath the fingernails and can also um, harbor pathogens under the fingernails. And we know that fingernails are, are the trickiest place to reach with hand hygiene. So especially if um, soil is used, which might be fecally contaminated, you need to balance the benefits of doing some hand washing with traditional materials against the risks of contaminating your hands. Um, there have also been some studies that show that uh, rinsing hands or rubbing hands uh, with water alone can reduce fecal contamination, not as much as uh, using either traditional materials or using soapy water or soap or alcohol hand rub, but still better than nothing. So if that's all that people have, uh, they could still do that. Um, we've had a lot of comments about what to do in water scarce settings and especially if you want to wash your hands many times with many people there's just not enough water in the household or for some um, for some people but it's important to note that hands you don't need a lot of water to wash hands uh, and there have been studies showing that as little as half a liter of water um, can be enough and if you if you get your hands wet perhaps if you use soapy water for instance um, and then do the lathering for 20 seconds at least, uh, and then use the, the rinse water. You don't actually need that much rinse water to, to, to get the hands um, free from the soap. And in any case, no matter what kind of material is used, it's important to wash both hands uh, and to do it for the, uh, at least 20 seconds to rub them together firmly and to you know, get all those different parts of the hands that are so easy to miss. Uh, and where water is widely available, using plenty of rinsing water um, also helps to reduce pathogen counts on hands. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I'd just like to share a couple of the statistics about hand hygiene in healthcare facilities that came out in the, the report that WHO and UNICEF published last year. And we're in the midst of updating that. We should have new data um, for washing healthcare facilities within a month or two. There are estimates right now out for country consultation. But for hygiene, the basic service uh, indicator is defined as having functional hand hygiene facilities. And by functional, it means that there's actually water and soap or alcohol-based hand rub. Um, and having those hand hygiene facilities present at points of care, uh, Claire and Julie were both talking about the importance of points of care, but also within five meters of toilets. Um, and Globally, there weren't enough countries that had data on hand hygiene in healthcare facilities to make a global estimate. There were only 55 countries that had data on hand hygiene facilities at points of care. You can see them on the right there. Um, and even fewer countries had uh, 
uh, estimates about um, water and soap in toilets. But there was enough data um, about healthcare facilities that had no kind of hand hygiene facilities at all to say that 16% or one in six healthcare facilities globally had no hand hygiene facilities either at points of care or um, uh, at toilets. And if you look at the points of care on the right, you can see that there's a lot of range, even within SDG regions. Um, you see within Sub-Saharan Africa, some countries have very high coverage, uh, some countries have very low coverage, but within all regions, there's um, you know, a big spread. This corresponds to uh, what Claire was referring to as the first of those multimodal strategies for building it. Because if, of course, if you don't have hand hygiene facilities at points of care, you can't uh, practice appropriate hand hygiene. And if you can just click, I've got one more um, uh, piece of data here. This is showing uh, the much smaller number of countries that had data on hand washing materials at toilets. Uh, so you can see, first of all, most countries didn't have any data on this, uh, but where there was data, it was typically um, less common to have soap and water at toilets than it was to have uh, hand hygiene facilities at points of care. So definitely a lot of work to be done. Um, it's not uh, too expensive to make sure that healthcare facilities do have hand hygiene facilities at points of care and at toilets. And uh, this data set will be updated later in the year. So with that, um, let me hand it back over to Anthony, um, who's going to take us to the next segment of the program. All right. Thank you very much, Rick. And thank you to Julie and Claire. I think that was a pretty clear message on the right time, right technique, the right strategy, and some data painting the picture. So um, being conscious of the time at the moment, we'll make sure to keep things rolling. Um, and I think what will be nice is to get a bit um, more granular perspective. So I think up next, we actually have a colleague, Pam Lee Yufong from Malaysia, who will share some country perspective. Uh, so I hand over to you, Pam. Hear me? We can hear you, but you sound very quiet. Okay. Um, just let me know if I'm not loud enough. So I'll be talking on the multimodal strategies, which was mentioned by Claire, and in particular, uh, training and education, basically teach it and to lift it, which is institutional safety climate, and how organizational cultures, in particular, uh, in communities and social networks could help. So first and foremost, I would like to emphasize that most challenges are reduced when we have an environment that facilitates patient safety issues uh, and it's set at a high priority at all levels. And therefore, it is very important to get the buy-in and commitment from leaders and managers to improve hand hygiene. However, uh, you might still face a common challenge, which is people just not wanting to perform hand hygiene despite having the facilities to do so. Now, we need to understand that hand hygiene is very much behavior driven. Hence, we have faced many people who know about good hand hygiene practices, but just do not want to do it. And this is because the choice of whether to perform hand hygiene is greatly influenced by a person's perception of what dirty means and their emotional need to clean their hands. And it is said that hand hygiene practices are quite similar to mothers in the community in that the ritual and the clue to hand wash uh, was developed during early childhood with the major driver to hand washing being based on personal protective behavior carried out with the aim to protect themselves rather than uh, currently what we want to do, which is to protect our patients. So as a result, the practice of hand hygiene is greatly um, influenced by the healthcare workers, community and household practices where they were raised as a child. So as implementers and as leaders in IPC, we need to know and acknowledge this point. And whether or not they practice it is therefore very much dependent on this. Now, another challenge that you would commonly face is that we have all the great ideas, but we have the wrong implementer. So it is said that 
multimodal strategies, in particular programs which include role models, opinion leaders and champions are known to be effective in improving hand hygiene because role models themselves actually act as a reminder. So it's important to choose the correct implementer. Uh, in certain settings, depending on the organizational culture, traditional approaches, which is based on rational and reasoning, might actually be considered to be less likely to improve hand hygiene. So we need to be very aware of what our organizational culture is. So we need to choose a correct change agent. It's not just having the correct leader, but you need to have a correct change agent which, the, which higher manage, management supports it. So ideally in the community especially, peer identified change agents should be used because they are regarded as uh, champions and positive role models and they are in fact the best implementers. However, depending on the social network, seniors can also be champions. So we need to identify who are really the people that are well liked and will be listened to. And the effect of selecting a leader may be simply because it works through that their direct social network of communication. So when we did a project in Malaysia on improving hand hygiene, we asked the staff, our healthcare staff, simple questions like who do you like and who would you like uh, in general or who would you like to have coffee with? And we chose these people as champions and we, we trained them and, and they were the one that cascaded all these things. Now lastly, which is what we commonly face is that we might have or not have all the correct guidelines in place, but the problem is that these protocols and guidelines are basically not read. We realized that the WHO hand hygiene guidelines were published in 2009, but many of the infection control personnel did not actually read them themselves. So therefore, we conducted training um, attended by attendees from every region and zone of the country, and we referred to the gold standard materials. And um, in order to gain trust from the attendees, uh, this point is very important because we actually promoted the credibility of the tra trainers. Because sometimes you think that this trainer is very well known and he is a, a big shot somewhere, but in fact, there are many people down the ground who don't know uh, their credibility. So it's important to actually um, give them due credit. And we did this through official, official channels like the Ministry of Health one or two months before, before the training itself. And uh, attendees were given additional, uh, we call it education points to, re to renew their practicing license. And um, when we had these training sessions, we also realized that the best feedback um, for hand hygiene performance was actually face-to-face -face feedback because we noticed that when individuals are given their personal hand hygiene compliance score and are not scores that are aggregated uh, and produced monthly, uh, people tend to be more interested to gain knowledge and which this was cascaded down to the community. Uh, so this is what I would like to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate that. Um, moving on to a, a country contact, I believe based in Nairobi with UNICEF, we have Fatima Gohar to share some insights on hand hygiene and healthcare in the context of COVID-19. Over to you, Fatima. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to to say a few words to our participants, those who are very experienced. Um, so. Warm greeting, greetings from the heart of Africa, Kenya. I'm Fatima Gohar, and as my colleague mentioned, I work with, I don't work in country office, I work with UNICEF Regional Office for Eastern and Southern Africa as maternal and newborn health specialist. So my focus would be on more, mostly on uh, maternity um, side of health facilities. Um, and for all of us, hand hygiene, issues with hand hygiene, compliance and everything is not new. These issues were there even before COVID, and um, and all of them have been very clearly identified by, by our earlier speaker. So I would not go in detail of the, those things. So now, what has changed during COVID time? I would divide that into quickly into because the time shortage. I'll divide that into two parts. One is from supply side. 
nothing has changed a lot. We still have, we still do not have regular water supplies um, to the health facility in general and in particular at the point of use. It was not there before, now it is also not there in many facilities. Availability of soap and sanitizer is still an issue. It's there, but not really, I mean, uh, to the optimum of, of its use. Shortage of healthcare providers coupled with increased workload and it, it really pressurizes them to, to do shortcuts and which includes not taking care of hand hygiene. From demand side, I would say uh, many countries are reporting there's a, they're seeing reduced utilization of essential services, which includes maternal newborn health and also EPI like things. And uh, some of the reasons which we are inferring, like which countries are reporting, one is people are fearful to come to health facilities. And that is one because of miscommunications and dreamers. But at the same time, it could be partly because of their earlier experience on the on the ambience, on the cleanliness, on the wash facilities in the in the in the health facilities, but in particular. So, which also makes them, you know, suspicious. If I, if we go there, we if we go to a health facility which is not clean, there's no water, so we we may yeah, we this puts us in a higher uh, a risk to get COVID. Um, so with all these things, I would say everything is not bad. There's one positive change and that positive change is we, we are seeing a high level of commitment, political commitment, donor commitment. There is a willingness from health provide, uh, health managers, provider uh, are also willing to change. That's That's something which is positive and I would say we should not uh, let it go to waste as Winston Churchill said that ne never let a good crisis to go waste. So with that I would uh, I, I mean um, I, I, I would like to emphasize on the on this um, uh, the strengthening of humanitarian and development nexus. I think it is a high time for us to uh, to bring this statement into life. And what that entails, uh, very briefly, I would say that we, whatever we invest now, please, we need to keep in mind post-COVID times too. So whatever we are doing now, for example, for WASH in health facilities, so think of the investment which is getting in for humanitarian support. How could we turn them into a longer term solution for, for availability of water in the health facilities? for the production of um, uh, local materials like hair quality hand sanitizer, chlorine, uh, innovative ways for soap production, mask and all those things. And then ensure the availability of hand hygiene. How, could it, how can we ensure that it is, it is available at the point of care, not just somewhere in the health facility and we take market, okay, it's available. And then also, uh, I think uh, the other thing where we need to invest is innovative way to monitor wash fit uh, tool in the health facilities. We need to um, think of digital solution. I mean, I'm, I might be sounding very ambitious, but I think it's a time when we have financial support, um, political commitment and everything. I think we, it's a time when we can build on all those uh, um, uh, positivities and, and can invest in our systems, uh, not just for the one, I mean, just to take, a, take care of this um, uh, crisis. And lastly, I would say, please, we need to work together with our health colleagues to invest on the infrastructure and systems for virtual learning, supportive supervision, monitoring, and mentoring. With that, I'll end here because I know it's just a few minutes left to end the webinar. Thank you, thank you. No, thank you, Fatima. I think that was well said. And I think you're right to mention the momentum is something that we should be capitalizing on so that we have long-term change, um, definitely. So loud and clear. Uh, moving on, we're gonna move next to a colleague from WaterAid, Alison McIntyre, who will share some insights on their work and ensuring hand hygiene in a range of healthcare facility setting during COVID and non-COVID times. Thank you, Anthony. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all. Um, as, as Anthony said, I'm going to present today a bit on our hand hygiene work as a whole, um, and also some of the considerations 
um, that we have at the moment around the COVID-19 response. Um, firstly, if we look at the picture in the top left of my screen, often, and, and that includes this webinar, we focus heavily on the hand hygiene of healthcare workers, but we know there's really a range of other people uh, at healthcare facilities that also need to practice good hand hygiene. So I'm not gonna focus specifically on the hand hygiene of healthcare workers in this presentation, but it is an area that WaterAid engages in both directly at the facility level, but also in other areas around pre-service training um, and some of the broader monitoring at a systems level around this. Um, so I'm gonna take you now to the second picture on the top, so the top right picture. Um, we have a grandmother and her granddaughter. And I highlighted this picture in particularly because not only do we have patients needing to practice hand hygiene, like we have in the bottom right picture, but there are also a number of other people um, that attend, including visitors, caregivers, et cetera, around patients. And in some of the areas where we work, there's often a ratio of one to five people. Um, so for every patient, there's sort of three to five other people that are present at the healthcare facility and sometimes stay for a number of days. And these are one of the groups um, that are often neglected in around the need to practice hand hygiene at healthcare facilities. Um, and so what parts are neglected? And first of all, it's considering that maybe healthcare facilities will track the number of staff and track the number of patients, but not actually realize that this might triple quadruple based on the number of other users at the healthcare facility. So firstly, sort of the demands on water use um, and soap, for example, but also the presence of hand hygiene facilities um, that are available for use for caretakers um, and visitors. And that includes in the wards. We know from some of the work we've done, while there are often functional hand hygiene stations, in places like delivery rooms, though that's not always the case, it's often more common than they are in say the postnatal ward or the pediatric ward. Etc. And what we do know is some of these people who are accompanying patients uh, to hospitals, they also provide a lot of caregiving. And so those five moments of hand hygiene that we discussed before are also critical for the care that they're providing um, to the patient. Um, so that's one consideration for who's left behind and who needs to practice hand hygiene in healthcare facilities. And I think that's really sort of needs to be reinforced, particularly in the current COVID-19 context. And so which technology should we use? If we look at the bottom left hand picture that I have is a hand hygiene station that was recently installed um, by our team in Nepal. Um, and this is kind of one we could think about in terms of um, installing in line with the WHO obligatory hand hygiene guidelines that have just come out. And that's really making sure that every single person that enters uh, the healthcare facility has clean hands. Um, and so this one here in particular is a non-touch technology. So there's a foot uh, pedal to start the water on the right-hand side, and then there's a foot pedal on the left-hand side for soap. Um, and that enables people to wash their hands and it has quite a large storage tank. So there's not a need to refill that container terribly often. So who is left behind in this case? Um, and, and if we look particularly at this technology, um, while it has very many benefits, we have to consider that there are lots of um, people that attend healthcare facilities or are using healthcare facilities that are living with disabilities or have uh, temporary limited mobility issues. And people could be using things like crutches or using wheelchairs that would be unable to access this hand hygiene. And we know how critical, particularly in the COVID-19 response, that everybody has um, access and is able to wash their hands. Um, and now is infrastructure enough? And while we might have something nice like the picture on the left-hand side or on the bottom right-hand side in place, which the one on the bottom right-hand side is designed specifically for people with limited mobility at a particular height um, for its use, um, it's not all that's needed. And we also know that just communication and training, even for healthcare workers, is not sufficient due to the low compliance rates we have in hand hygiene uh, behaviours. And so what are the things that we're working on around trying to drive behaviour change, not only of healthcare workers, but also all the other users at healthcare facilities. And one of those approaches is around using behaviour centred design. So this is a theory that WASH people have used in the community for quite some time, including WaterAid. And we're now um, adapting this tool for use in healthcare facilities that goes beyond just knowledge and looks at things like motivations, emotions, social norms, um, and the physical environment that will really support and drive behaviour change. And we're working on this in terms of researching its effectiveness with the London 
School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. But also in those installations, it's not only important to have instructions about how to wash hands, but also things like nudges and cues. So can there be footprints or a direction that people are taken as they enter the facility directly to a hand hygiene station to prompt that hand washing? In addition, looking at physical distancing, um, Practices is to have marks on the ground or circles on the ground so that people are staying physically distant as they queue and wait um, for their turn to be able to wash their hands. Um, and I think I might just leave it there. So thank you. Oh, thank you for that, Alison. I think that was, um, it was quite concise and succinct and important uh, points of consideration, especially thinking about the sort of non-verbal communication cues that we can give to sort of support such an important intervention, both I think within communities and, um, and in healthcare facilities. Um, just looking at the time, I see that we are coming very close. So we might make a slight modification here. Originally, we were gonna have a short Q&A, um, but what I will encourage is for people to continue using the chat box and putting their questions down, because unfortunately we, we won't have enough time to really open it up more broadly. But I do want to reiterate that all questions entered in the chat um, in the chat will be addressed in the moment if possible, and if not, we'll go towards um, a bank of frequently asked questions that we are compiling and will update and publish um, to address some of the questions that maybe we don't have time for today or maybe require a bit more time for follow up. But with that said, I do want to give just a, uh, a quick moment to one of our co colleagues here from uh, Vietnam, Ms. Hung, the um, General Director from the Ministry of Health in Vietnam. Did you want to just give us a few words? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to share experience on hand hygiene in Vietnam, uh, especially for COVID-19 prevention. Hand hygiene compliance in healthcare facilities has been improved significantly in Vietnam in recent years. A survey, uh, a survey conducted in 2005 in Vietnam shows that the rate of hand hygiene compliance among healthcare workers was only 30.4%. But in 2007, this rate increased to 30% to 40% in 2007. And in 2008 and 2009, many hospitals achieved a 70% of hand hygiene compliance in average. Hand washing is a practice of patient caregivers, patient family members, and visitors have to reduce the risk of hospital infection. However, the coverage of people who often practice hand washing with shop is low, especially in rural and mountainous areas. There are many factors that impact to hand hygiene compliance of healthcare staff in Vietnam, including uh, the lack of infrastructures, supplies, knowledge, or due to overload, abuse of drafts, lack of supervision and measures to create a hand hygiene behavior. In order to promote hand hygiene in hand hygiene, in 2007, the Ministry of Health issues a guideline on hand hygiene practice in healthcare facility. The guidelines include includes a required infrastructure, supplies, techniques, and moments for hand hygiene, use of gloves, chemicals for hand hygiene, training, monitoring, and evaluation. The Ministry of Health also implemented green, clean, and beautiful hospitals, which include hand hygiene criteria. Communication on hand hygiene also be regularly performed in various uh, manner. Uh, manners, for example, hand hygiene campaign, hand washing day, hand hygiene contest, leaflet, poster, hand hygiene flash mob dance. Key message is often washing hand with shop for at least 30 seconds at critical moments or use hand sanitizers. So um, for the COVID-19 uh, COVID prevention, since the beginning of the outbreak, the Ministry of Health of Vietnam has developed and this uh, disseminated uh, communication messages on regular hand washing with soap and clean water in six steps for at least 30 seconds. If soap and water are not available, use hand sanitizer products containing at least 60% alcohol, which is licensed by the Ministry of Health. Um, uh, develop guidelines on prevention of COVID-19 infection in healthcare facilities, including hand hygiene guidance for the health worker patients, caregivers, and their family members. For the health worker, besides hand hygiene practice, 
at five critical moments, three additional hand washing are required. First, in the process of wearing and removing personal protective equipment. Second, before finishing the work in isolation or quarantine area and going out. Third, before coming home, patient and family members are also requested, requested to wash their hands regularly. The message on hand washing with soap and clean water to prevent COVID-19 were widely disseminated to the people uh, in Vietnam through the website, mass media, uh, loudspeaker system in the community, leaflet, uh, infographics, song and dances to promote and hand washing with soap. Uh, many donors has uh, donated soap, detergent, hand sanitizer products, and mobile hand washing station to hospital clinics and quarantine uh, facility. Shop detergent and hand sanitizers are available in almost every shops in Vietnam. Uh, lesson and recommendation. First, uh, communication, education, monitoring, and reminding on hand hygiene should be carried out regularly. Provision of enough hand hygiene facility and conditions is very essential. The message on hand hygiene, hand hygiene should be accurate and appropriate to the actual situation. When starting the COVID-19 outbreak, Vietnam used the hand hygiene message as disinfecting hands or washing hands with soap and clean water. The term disinfecting hands is placed first in the message, leading to the fact that health workers and people concerned to buy and use hand sanitizers but forgot about, forget about washing hands with soap and clean water, resulting to lack of hand sanitizer for healthcare workers. Then the, the Ministry of Health uh, immediately changed the message to often washing hands with soap and clean water. If soap and clean water are not available, use an alcohol-based hand uh, sanitizer containing at least 60% uh, alcohol. Before COVID-19, hand sanitizer products were used in healthcare facility only, only rather than in communities. Fourth, making your own hand sanitizer, sanitizer would not be recommended because all hand sanitizers must be licensed by the Ministry of Health. So pre preparation process does not ensure safety and some chemicals like alcohol can easily cause fire. On the other hand, required alcohol or uh, chemical concentration would not be met to ensure the, the disinfection efficacy. Thank you uh, for your listening. Thank you for that. Um, definitely very valuable uh, on the ground information and I think a very comprehensive response to, to the times that we're in. So we, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to give us that insight from Vietnam. Um, that definitely takes us to over time. I apologize that we weren't able to keep full right to the hour, but not too bad, we're just five minutes over. I do want to re-emphasize that the slides, had. there was a link I think in the chat box being sent to everyone repeatedly, but they will be in the um, WASH and Healthcare Facility Portal, along with the recording of this presentation today. And again, if your question wasn't answered, I do apologize, but we are taking that into our bank of FAQs and we will follow up, we do promise with that. And then I just add that you can obviously see on the screen that we do have the dates for the upcoming webinars. So the next one being Tuesday, the 21st of April, focusing on environmental cleaning and the 23rd for sanitation. So again, thank you to everyone, hope this was helpful and insightful for, for the times that we are in now and look forward to, to collaborating further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.